with Suleiman Bashir Diyan. Bashir is a professor of French and philosophy here at Columbia University. Originally from Senegal, he received his academic training in mathematical logic and philosophy in France, where he went to the École Normale Supérieure and the Sorbonne, where he earned his doctorate, doctorat d'état in philosophy. His fields of, reach, of research include the history of logic, the history of philosophy, Islamic philosophy, African philosophy, and literature. He's published a number of books, including Islam et la Société Ouverte, la, Fidé la Fidélité et le Mouvement dans la Pensée de Muhammad Iqbal, Léopold Sédar Senghor, L'Art Afri Africain comme Philosophie, and Comment Philosophie en Islam. His latest book is Bergson Postcolonial, L'Élan Vital dans la Pensée de Léopold Sédar Senghor et de Muhammad Iqbal. In 2009, Bashir was awarded the prestigious Mohamed El Fazi Prize from the Agence Universitaire de la Francophonie. He has also held important government positions in Senegal, where then President Abdou Diouf named him Counselor for Education and Culture in 1993, a position which he held through 1999. Bashir is also a member of the scientific committees of Diogène and the the Conseil pour le Développement de la Recherche en Sciences Sociales en Afrique, and he sits on UNESCO's Council on the Future. Bashir. Thank you very much. And I will continue along the lines of what Charles said when he explained that uh, French matters because Africa matters, or I may have not actually got exactly that point, but I understand that is what you say. <laughs> so, my main point here would be to say that French matters because French is indeed a key that opens the word known as francophonie. It gives access to the literary and intellectual productions from that word, the word that indeed matters. But before I become lyrical about <laughs> that word, which matters, and so on, I would like to let my devil's advocate ask me the following question. Well then, why does francophonie matter? Let me try this answer to my devil's advocate. Look at the map, I would say, of the pays ayant le français en partage, as francophonie is defined beautifully. That's a wonderful definition. L'ensemble des pays ayant le français en partage. Uh, and if you look at the map, if you put some green, let's say, for all the countries that belong to Francophonie, you end up having some kind of sixth continent uh, emerging. So I could then, to answer my devil's advocate, start speaking of the richness of the heritage thus represented, its breadth, but also its historical depth. Take, for example, Africa's oral traditions, the literature that we call sometimes oratio, to uh, um, just coin a word uh, on the pattern of literature. French poet Blaise Sandra published in 1921 a book titled Anthologie Negre. That's not very well known in, in Blaise Sandra's production, otherwise uh, poetic production. The purpose of his Anthologie Negre published in 1921 was to manifest, I quote him, la beauté et la puissance plastique des langues africaines. So he was finding an expression and a celebration in French of the African languages in which originally the tales, the short stories, the narratives, uh, the myth uh, that he had collected in his anthology were produced. Uh, my colleague and friend Vincent de Bain uh, explains in an article soon to be published the importance of the different anthologies of the kind that were published in the early 20th century, all of them signaling the existence of a literature or an orature that deserves to be known and studied, that indeed matters. As Vincent writes, in the case of Sandra, his anthology, his anthology neg, conveys the message that African oral tradition manifests some aesthetic ideal that matters and is a contribution to our universal heritage. He did, by uh, uh, publishing this anthology uh, message, 
the equivalent of what his friend, uh, another poet, Guillaume Apollinaire, did in the field of aesthetics. Guillaume Apollinaire, during the same time, was writing many articles calling for uh, the move of African artifacts from Place du Trocadero, that ethnological museum, to the Louvre because what he was advocating was the acknowledgement that these were objects of art and not just fetishes to be left for the curiosity of uh, uh, self-proclaimed ethnologists. So he was doing exactly the same thing with that <coughs> anthology. And it is important because an anthology by its very nature always conveys the message that what is being collected there does matter. And I'm sure my neighbor Adam would be <coughs> agreeing with me on this. So did Senghor's Anthologie de la Nouvelle Poésie Negre et Malgache de Langue Française, published 27 years later in 1948. The message of that anthology has been translated beautifully by Jean-Paul Sartre in the preface he gave to that anthology, and, uh, which is entitled Black <coughs> Orpheus. In a way, analogous to Sandra celebrating a little uh, uh, before the richness and the beauty of African creativity, finding its expression in French, Sartre was saluting the epiphany, so to say, in a French language, uh, truly appropriated by the black poets of the anthology, what he called the true revolutionary poetry of our times. So, to complete my answer to the devil's advocate, I would say that that literature which appropriated French as its medium of expression for African creativity has now exponentially developed, and this is why, indeed, French matters. But the devil, or its advocate, <laughs> never surrenders, as you know, especially when that devil takes the figure of a Kenyan talented Kikuyu writer, <laughs> just a Mao Mao then, Ngugi Wachiongo. So Ngugi would reply, races, matter. I'm just asking, why does it have to be francophone? Why not Europhone in general, or better, Africaphone? Actually, you recognize here in the question I'm posing, or that the devil's advocate is posing, the central argument of Ngugi Wachongo's decolonizing the mind. And this conversation I'm imagining with the devil's advocate is not imagined at all. I had this conversation with Ngugi Wachongo. And we were, this was the early 1980s, and both of us, we were visiting professors at the University of Bayreuth. This was the first time I met him, and we lived together in the same apartment that was given to us by the university. And Gugi was, at the time, planning to write his Decolonizing the Mind, and he wanted to target especially Senghor, because Senghor represented, for him, Francophony at its worst. And uh, Senghor's prose is not translated. Until now, most of it is not translated into English at all. So he wanted me to translate from French some of what Senghor was saying. And it was a beautiful uh, uh, spectacle. I loved to actually somehow fuel and fan his outrage at what Senghor was saying, because Senghor was saying, I love French. When I learned French, it melted under my tongue like chocolate. And <laughs> Boogie would just jump on his chair and say, he really said that? He really wrote that? <laughs> what a... French uh, 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 man. So <laughs> this is when Gugi wrote his Decolonizing the Mind, targeting so much of Senghor, and if you have the text, he thanks me there for having translated for him, but not from what my position then was. So Gugi decided from then on, he had already decided not to write any fiction in any other language than his native Kikuyu. And he decided from then on not to write any theory either in English. Uh, Ngugi's position is understandable. 
and it has been followed very little in the Francophone world, actually. But in the Francophone world, I could quote my uh, uh, compatriot, uh, Sheikh Ali Undao, who decided as well never to write uh, a line in French uh, also. Or another compatriot of mine, Boubacar Bolistiop, who at one point decided to write a novel in Wolof, Lomigolo, and then he retranslated himself into French and published uh, his French version of Domigolo titled Les Petits de la Gueule. So here is my response. The response, I am not sure I articulated that precisely then when I had that discussion with Ngugi Wachongo, and this is why I would like to tell him now that <laughs> the question of why French matters has been asked by Shani under the figure of the devil's advocate um, uh, having a dialogue. Senghor, by using those words that seemed so outrageous to him, like French being like chocolate and so on and so forth, was just expressing his own relationship to the French language. He's a poet, probably one of the greatest poets in French language of the 20th century. When you're a poet, you declare your love to the language that you are actually uh, 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 dealing with uh, every single day. And it is quite normal for you. Expressing that type of relationship to the French language is actually what every single writer from Francophonie, but also every single writer from France does. Mm -hmm. We, all writers, have this kind of complicated relationship to the language. And this is what Sartre, to come back to him, understood and beautifully expressed in Black Orpheus. What was he saying? He was actually repeating Mallarmé and uh, the notion that literary creation always happens in this écart, in this gap, that one at one point feels vis-a-vis -vis the language in which one is going to write. And he wrote that preface at a time when surrealism was still so important. So what the point he made was that the black poets of the anthology collected by Senghor actually lived that eka, that gap, better than anyone else. So they were able to achieve what surrealism was aiming at better than the surrealist poets themselves. So that eka is what Francophonie is. It is not just something that finds expression in French. It is the complicated language that all Francophone writers have with the French language. One aspect of that eka, of that complicated relationship, could be, for example, what has been called the tropicalism. Tropicalism is a word invented by uh, Congolese writer Sonida Boutansi to characterize the particular style of uh, African writers who would be appropriating French in that particular way where they incorporate to the French language uh, their own uh, uh, peculiarities that he called tropicalism. It could take the form of what I call l'écriture entre deux, writing in between, writing in between two languages. And the pro probably the best representative of that writing between two languages would be Ahmadou Kuruma, the, uh, the Ivorian writer who used somehow to speak Malenke in French in his writing. A third expression of that complicated relationship to the language would be Boubacar Wolis Diop that I mentioned earlier, who moved away from France following what he witnessed in Rwanda and then came back to French by retranslating from Wolof his own novel into French. Three different ways of leaving that particular écart, leaving that particular complicated relationship to a language. But actually, I insist on one thing. This is fully realized somehow in Francophone literature, and that is why Francophone literature matters and is not just a matter of expressing oneself in some foreign language, the way Ngubi Wachongo uh, understood it, but in terms of having 
the type of complicated relationship each writer has with the language in which he writes. After all, literature is about inventing your own long within the language you write in. And this is what francophony does. The reason why French matters is that francophony matters, and the reason why francophony matters is that francophony is a unique perspective on one particular type of eka, which is creative and productive, and that we need to know. If you agree that my devil's advocate could concede this point, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs>